This is the Creality Ender 5S1. This printer has a high temperature hot end that can reach up to 300 degrees Celsius. It has a direct extruder and it is equipped with a filament runout sensor. The Ender 5S1's main setting point seems to be its high print speeds. Today we are going to take a closer look at the Ender 5S1. I'm going to tell you what I like about this printer, what I don't like about this printer, and why I would only recommend this printer to some people. So without further ado, my name is Valentin and this is Craftlights 3D. So let's start at the beginning with packaging and the setup of the printer. The Ender 5S1 is very well packaged. The printhead, which is by far the most delicate part of the printer, is stored in the middle of the package surrounded by multiple layers of foam, so nothing should ever happen to it. The printer only comes partially assembled, but you don't need to know anything about 3D printing to assemble it. All you need to do is build the frame, install the heated bed and finally plug in all of the cables and the PTFE tube. The Ender 5S1 also comes with very detailed and illustrated instructions that will show you very clearly how to assemble the printer. All of the screws are also labeled, which helps a lot with the assembling process. Once assembled, the printer bed only needs to be leveled and the printer is good to go. The whole assembly process took me about 25 minutes. Also, the Ender 5S1 comes with some screws for assembly, a PTFE tube for assembly, some tools for the assembly, a USB adapter for the SD card, a big 8GB SD card, a spare brass nozzle, some cable ties, a metal spatula, some pliers, a well illustrated manual and 200 grams of white PLA filament. The Ender 5S1 also comes with these clips for cable management, which I really, really like. These clips are basically used to clip all of the cables that run from the bottom part of the printer to the top part of the printer, here on the back of these aluminium profiles. And as you can see, it looks very clean, so the cable management on this printer is really well done. Now all that is left to do is level the printer, and then we can move on to the first print. The leveling process on the Ender 5S1 is pretty straightforward. First you have to set the Z offset with a piece of paper. And then the printer will probe the whole print bed and create a mesh. And we are good to go to print our first test pieces. The first model I printed was this Benji. It is printed at 120mm per second. And this is the pre-sliced model that comes with the printer. So this was already on the SD card. I simply selected it and press start. And as you can see, it turned out decently. There is a lot of stringing and there are also some surface imperfections, especially where the overhangs on the door and on the round windows are. And there is a big surface imperfection right near the door on the other side of the Banshee. But don't worry, this seems to be an issue with the pre-sliced model that is on the SD card. For some reason it didn't turn out as good, later on I will slice my own models and they turn out much better. Creality recommends using the Creality Slicer, which is their own slicer software that is based on Cura 4.8.2. But I generally prefer using Cura instead of the Creality Slicer. So what I did is I installed the Creality Slicer and then I copied all of the settings for the Ender 5S1 over to my version of Cura. Also, an interesting side note, the Banshee model that is pre-sliced on the SD card was actually sliced with Cura 5 instead of the Creality Slicer. You can easily check this by opening the pre-sliced file in the text editor and then on the top you can see this was sliced with Cura 5. Anyway, I imported the 3D Banshee into my version of Cura and then I re-sliced it with the exact same settings that I transferred over from the Creality Slicer. And as you can see, it turned out much better this time. There is almost no stringing anymore and the overhangs look much better as well. There is however a slight surface imperfection on the front part of the ship and I'm not quite sure why. And I didn't have any issues with this in future prints. Now up until now I only printed with 120mm per second and with about 2000mm per second squared acceleration. 
but Creality promises that you can print all the way up to 250 millimeters per second on this machine. So let's test that, shall we? This Banshee was printed with 250 millimeters per second and 2000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. And as you can see, the print quality suffered quite significantly. While it looks quite good for the most part, you can see that the cooling just wasn't enough for the front part of the ship. There are also quite a lot of surface imperfections and as you can see, the overhang, especially on the one door, didn't turn out that great either. Creality promises that you are able to print a Banshee in about 35 minutes. However, I don't think this is quite possible with the printer as it is right now. We will print a sub 30 minute Banshee later on, but before we get to that, let's first take a look at the print quality of this printer. So to determine the print quality, I first printed the all-in-one 3D printer test micro by MIDA 107, and as you can see, it turned out pretty good. As you can see, there is a lot of very fine string, which usually isn't a big issue. It was able to clear the bridging tests as well, but when it came to the overhangs, you can see it was only able to print all the way up to 60 degrees. This is a clear indicator that the cooling just isn't good enough for overhangs like these. Next, I printed the Torture Toaster by Clockspring 3D. This model turned out quite nicely. I just broke the lever when I was removing the print from the print pad. I was able to move all of the moving parts on the toaster, and as you can see, the printer was again able to print overhangs all the way up to about 60-65 degrees. And if you take a look at the clearance test, I was able to push the pin with 0.3mm clearance up. The 0.2 and 0.1 pins, however, were fused. I finally also printed a calibration cube to test the accuracy of the printer, and as you can see, it is almost perfect. Overall, the print quality of this printer is really, really good. There are some issues with parts cooling, but this won't be an issue for most models, especially if you print at lower speeds. In the end, I printed well over 50 hours on this machine. I mainly printed the stackable storage boxes by Lucky Resistor, and as you can see, they turned out really well. While printing the boxes, I also tested the filament runout sensor. That's why some of these boxes are printed in two different colors. The filament runout sensor works flawlessly, and I didn't have one single failed print during my whole 50 hours of testing. Next, let's take a look at the LCD screen and the PC build plate. The LCD screen is easy to use and easy to navigate. However, there are some issues that I ran into. The first issue I had was I was able to set the nozzle temperature under the menu point prepare to 210 degrees, for example for PLA, but after that I wasn't able to set it back to zero. If I wanted to set the nozzle temperature back to zero, I had to enter the temperature setting menu point and then there I was able to set nozzle temp back to zero. And this is just weird and confusing really. Also, the LCD screen tends to beep whenever you press a button or enter a menu point, which can be really annoying after some time. But other than that, the menu points are very easy to find and the LCD screen responds quite nicely. Secondly, let's take a look at the PC build plate. Prints tend to adhere very well to the PC build plate, to a point where you are barely able to remove it without damaging the plate itself. This is normal for PC build plate, so before you are using a PC build plate, you have to apply a glue to it as a release agent, so that your 3D prints don't adhere too well to the surface. When you do that, you won't have any issues with removing your 3D prints from the build plate. In fact, my 3D prints came off quite nicely and there is no residue on the PC build plate at all, even after 50 hours of printing with it. Next, let's take a look at the power consumption of the Ender 5S1. The power consumption is quite low if you consider the speed at which this printer is able to print. While idle, this printer will consume around 13 watts, and while this printer is printing, it will consume around 130 to 300 watts. So on average, this printer will consume around 0.13 kilowatts an hour. The Ender 5S1 is also not very loud. 
During high-speed printing, the printer will reach around 50 to 53 decibels, and while it's idle, it will be almost completely silent. When it comes to printing ABS, ASA or nylon on the Ender 5S1, then you won't be able to print all of these materials right out of the box. If you want to print ABS or ASA, then you will need an enclosure that is sold separately for the Ender 5S1. And if you want to print nylon on the Ender 5S1, then you will need the enclosure and additionally you will also need a hardened steel nozzle, because the Ender 5S1 only comes with a brass nozzle. Now let's finally look at the print speed. In the beginning of this video I mentioned that I was able to print a Banshee in less than 30 minutes. So how did I do that? Well, simply put, I installed Clip on this machine. And if you are planning on getting the Ender 5 as one, or if you have one at home, then I can highly recommend installing Clipper on this machine because it will basically unlock the full potential of this machine. Now the easiest way to install Clip on this machine is using the Creality Sonic Pad. However, you can also install Clip on this machine by using, for example, an old laptop if you have one lying around. Simply install Linux on the laptop and then install Clipper on that, connect it to your printer and, well, fine-tune it. There are several tutorials online that will show you exactly how to do that. Alternatively, you can also use a Raspberry Pi to install Clipper on the Ender 5S1 or you can use a Orange Pi for example, which is much cheaper right now. I use the Sonic Pad, which is very easy to set up, just connect it to the printer and then follow the on-screen instructions. Once everything is set up, you will be able to print with 250 mm per second and with 5000 mm per second squared acceleration, which is more than twice as fast as before. By the way, you can't set the acceleration to over 2000 mm per second squared on Cura. Well, you can, but the firmware of the printer will simply ignore anything that goes above 2000 mm per second squared. So the only way you can get 5000 mm per second squared acceleration on the Ender 5S1 is by using Clipper. And with Clipper installed, I was able to print a Banshee, the same Banshee as before, in less than 30 minutes. I think it was 29 minutes and 30 seconds. And as you can see, it turned out really well. There are some issues, some surface imperfections, as you can see, especially at overhangs. But this is because there simply isn't enough part cooling to allow the printer to print overhangs as fast as I did here. All of the stackable storage boxes that I showed earlier were printed with the Ender 5S1 running on Clipper. So I printed all of these with the same acceleration and the same speed. But because they don't have any overhangs, the quality was much, much better. So in the end, I can recommend the Ender 5S1 to all of you who are willing to upgrade the printer to Clipper. Clipper simply unlocks the true potential of the Ender 5S1. And even though it is a quite capable printer without Clipper, it's just so much faster and easier to use with Clipper installed. Creality now also sells the Ender 5S1 bundled with the Creality Sonic Pad. So if you are planning to get the Ender 5S1, I highly recommend to either get the bundle with the Sonic Pad or to get the Ender 5S1 as it is and then upgrade it on your own later on. And as always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below.